million things I want to talk with you about. Thank you for sending me your book. Oh my gosh. I, my, it was my pleasure to send it. I'm, I've been listening to your podcast. Oh, I feel, I relate so much to you. And I can't believe what a fast reader you are. Because <laughs> I thought you'd already gotten it. And then when I found out you didn't have it, I was like, oh my God, I got to get it to her. We live really close together. Oh, we, yeah. I'm like five minutes away. And yeah. then, um, you know, but it was like two days ago, not even. And I said, oh, if you need to push it. And they're like, oh, Jeanette, we'll be done by then. And I thought that would take me like four years to read. <laughs> even though it's no. a fast read. It's a fast read, but I would still be like, oh my God, I need much more time. I mean, you're a smart cookie. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, but I, I think it's less about my smarts and more about it being very entertaining. And a lot of the parent stuff I, I really related so deeply on. It's definitely something that I want to cover. But also, you're fucking the packaging. Like, I wait, get this you, box. you cut in and out. I couldn't hear what you just said. I'm so sorry. The Wi Fi is hurting me. I was just throwing compliments your way. I was <laughs> throwing some I'll excessive take it. compliments. I'll, I'll take that. Um, and, and I was so impressed by the packaging. I don't know who's oh responsible God. for this, if this was your idea, but I fucking loved it. It's like it comes in this box and then there's this ribbon and then I, there was like a puzzle and then there's a book bag, which I will be using frequently. And then the book and then the cart. It was like this. Oh my God. Oh, I loved oh. it. I did all of that. Thank you so you much. Did? Was, I did all of that. I, did, I designed all of it. I made all of it. I just thought I'm going to treat myself like I'm John Grisham and I have a big book coming out. <laughs> if I was John Grisham, who was like a millennial girl with like, you know, access to uh, designing things. Um, yeah, <laughs> I just, I don't know if I'll ever write a book again. I hope I do. But I just yeah. remember thinking like, I I love making things and I love like the magic and I wanted it to be an exciting little present to arrive. Like I wanted it to, particularly in times like this, to feel like a party arrived on your doorstep. It, you nailed it. It feels like an occasion. It reminds me of, uh, I love like Glossier, the yes. beauty brand's packaging. Yes. It comes in a little pink bubble package. And I don't care what anybody says, they want that bubble package more than they want the eyeliner. It's like you get so excited about it, you know? <laughs> oh my God. I 100% agree with you about the Glossier as well as I just got my first product from Drunk Elephant and they... <gasps> Also, their boxing is as exciting as my box. Like their boxing <laughs> is so cute. It's like, it feels, it feels like a Tokyo party explosion. Just yes. like anime. <laughs> like I just, I'll order anything, even if it's slightly overpriced, just to get my paws on that box. Yes. Yes. I've gotten like little mini versions of their stuff. And there's like orange confetti that pops out and it comes in like oh. a pink lidded little yes. contraption thing. I mean, let's be real. Life is hard right now. And everybody just needs a little something, something just to be like, oh, I'm going to be okay just for today. Just for today, I can do this. Yes. Yeah. That was exactly how I felt when I got your Yay. book package. So, um, so thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I'm so glad to have you have you on here. I kind of want to talk about, like, as I mentioned, the, the parent relationships is one main area. And then also just kind of comedy because that's You've had such a long career in comedy and you've bounced around from sketch comedy to to sitcoms and multi-cam sitcoms, single cam sitcoms. So you've kind of seen all of it. And yeah. I want to just have to get in there and and figure out how you feel about comedy, what your what your point of view is and why your point of view is that, if that's cool. I love that. Also, Jerry Trainer is my good friend and he he uh. I told him I was doing your podcast. He was like, I love her so much. The last time I saw her was at her one woman show. And I it was so moving. And I remember crying with her and giving her a big hug afterwards. And I was so proud of her. And I'm just wishing her like nothing but joy and all good things in life. Oh. He couldn't believe we were talking. He was so excited by this combo. Jerry is one of my favorite people. I absolutely adore him. Me too. So with your... I'm going to be just completely switching gears here. Yes. Just going right to it. The parents. Yes. Back yeah. to back. Yes. Yeah. How are you dealing with all that? You know, I will say... So for those of you who don't know, I write my book, Little Miss Little Compton, which is mostly like a fun beach read, but then it takes a turn. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Love there's, the turn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes it... I actually think it makes it a, a better read. I think not... It just makes it more real, you know? And um Your mom timed her death perfectly. Dude, I can't <laughs> even like I, I if you told it was just so crazy. She wasn't even really in the proposal. And so basically hey. in my book, you know, I wrote this proposal for the book and my my dad was a tricky guy and 
when we I, I'm on I was on the Netflix show Insatiable and he died right before we started filming season one and so I had to like go to this you know, being an Airbnb in Atlanta. And he was really a tough... He wasn't very a warm person. And I thought... And he'd been sick so much of my life. I thought... I thought it would mostly just be a relief that... Hit, like it was... Like the pain was over. Right. But I was surprised to find sort of how painful it was and sort of mourning what never happened. And then I was mm-hmm. sort of feeling... So like a year passed, I was, you know, like... I, it's different for everyone, but when I, you know, when you lose, for me, it took about a year for me to sort of start feeling like myself again. And so, like, you know, so a year had passed. Six months later, I'm so excited. I've been bumped up to series regular on Insatiable. Season two is starting. We're back. We're like four days into episode one, yeah. and and nobody could get in touch with my mom. And I was actually with Debbie Ryan. I was with some of the cast, and. And they they found my mom. She died. They found her on the ground. And she died making breakfast. And, mm. you know, and I'd been trying to sell this book for a long time. And she was barely in the proposal. And I got this email, you know, a couple of days later, I was at her funeral. I was driving to her funeral. And I get this email that was like, you know, hope you're having a great week. I, like we're so excited. To just, I found out I sold the book on the, on the way to her funeral. And so I was like, um, I'm not really having a great week. But, you know, I will say, so it was back to back. And and then I will say it's very similar to the pandemic. It's almost like a third one. <laughs> but mm. I mean, I'm sure you know, I mean, you, you lost your mom too, right? Yeah, yeah. How how many years ago has it been? So it's been it's been a, a minute now. I mean, it's I don't know. I don't know about you, but I really like I really felt like particularly with that one cuz she was great and the book really became her book. My friend calls it my memoir. Like she read it and it's <laughs> not my memoir, it's my memoir, but like I really felt like a Macy's Day balloon that the handlers had like 13 of the 14 handlers had lost control of, but there was one one person tethering me to earth. (laughs) And, you know, and that was, I guess, what I also wanted to write in the book about how sort of the inconceivable had happened. And I certainly wouldn't wish it on anyone, but that by... I really believe if you got to feel it to heal it, but that there's certain Mm -hmm. things you can do and that you can... Like my worst nightmare happened and I'm still myself. And I... And I certainly cried every day for many, many months, but I also had some joy and laughter and made sure I got help like so that I could just go be not okay. And I don't know if this happened to you, but like one of the gifts of grief for me was... And I think this is like sort of what's happening in the pandemic. I think it's sort of a global grief, both between the virus and the shutdown of normalcy and then everything, you know, our like the national reckoning with like, Black Lives Matters and kind of taking a look at, you know, all of our parts and what's been going on for years. But one of the gifts of like grief for me is as a people pleaser, I'm such a people pleaser. And this happened with my dad too, for both times, I felt like I had no skin. And the gift of that was, it was very, very clear to me who I wanted to be with, who I didn't want to be with. Mm -hmm. What activities seemed fun, what didn't seem fun. What I wanted, like, and I couldn't, I literally physically couldn't force myself to fake it. Whereas in the past, I would say 60% of my life is saying yes to things I don't want to say yes to in the past. (laughs) One of the gifts of it was like, I can't, I couldn't do it. I can't do it anymore. And it was very clear of like, I really want to be with this person. I was very excited to come do your podcast. I felt kinship with you. Just... I don't know, just there's something about like, I, it was clear who was safe. It eliminated people. I didn't think will eliminate. And then I, you know, it was, I kind of instinctively knew how to take care of myself. I'm like, okay, I need a nap. And now I need to go dancing. And now like, I need to be alone. Like, okay, now I need to be with people who can be okay with me not being okay. Like, cause mm-hmm. some people can't handle it. Some people are really freaked out by it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and it's weird. You don't know who it's going to be. Like, some of the weirdest people, right? Debbie Ryan has become one of my best friends. And like, 
she really rose to the challenge. She wasn't scared by it. And I, I never in a million... I mean, I always loved her, but like there was something like she really was there for me in a way mm-hmm. I would never have guessed. Like, you know, we talk every day still. And, and, and then there's certain people in my life that I thought would have been there that... But I think it was just too much, particularly back to back. It just was overwhelming and they didn't know what to say. I mean, did that happen for you? They just kind of fell off. Well, it's interesting. It sounds like you're describing kind of a clarity of self that happens with when it's like when you go into crisis mode and just everything that doesn't matter kind of evaporates. I yeah. almost had, I almost had the opposite, honestly, where it was like my mom was everything to me to the point that, and I relate to your, you know, your biggest fear happening because I w- it was to the point where I would make my birthday wish every year when my, my birthday came around to keep my mom alive because she yeah. had cancer for the first time when I was young. So I always kind of was aware of the fragility of her health. Right. So then when she finally, when she passed, I was 21 and I was just didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know who I was. I had no sense of identity. I didn't right. know up from down. I fell really bad and I got really bad alcohol issues, fell really deeply into an eating disorder. And yeah. it was just all this shit that I was turning to hanging out with the wrong the wrong crowds, I would say, and zero clarity of self. Now I feel like I have that because I think it does take going through some shit to realize who you are and what you want. And I'm, I'm really grateful that it happened. But initially it was just like, let me just throw stuff at a wall and see what sticks and hope that it does. And here we go. It was like complete chaos. Uh, so I admire that about you, that you were able to kind of check into that clarity immediately. That's that's really wise. Well, I I mean, I would... Well, thank you. I would say, you know, looking... I, I'm a little farther down the path than you in life. And I would say, like, if this had happened to me in my early 20s, I, I actually found, even without a parent dying, I found... A, I think this is actually true of a lot of my female friends. I actually think the mid twenties and the twenties to me were very hard, it and that sucks. was it's not fun. It sucks. <laughs> it sucks, and it also sucks because, it, like, in theory, and then like pop culture and stuff in the world, there's all this pressure that's sort of like you're sp- you're in your twenties, you're supposed to be having the best time ever, and I was like, <laughs> I'm so fucking depressed. Like, like I. F- I was so isolated. I was so depressed. I mean, yeah. everything that you talked about, like. You know, I had certain things fucking pop a little, you know, like a whack a mole of issues yes. pop, pop up. Like, yes. wait, now we're over here. Like, this is what we're dealing with. Like, so let me just say, let me just say, it just so happened to happen a little bit later for me, where I'd already gone and sort of worked on all that stuff. <laughs> so, so like, I was aware that I had my systems in place. Just to be a human on earth, and I think in particular a human female in, in, on earth, and then you add to it a human female on earth on television in the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> and so I certainly had my, you know, my go around with I got cast because I was funny and quirky and stuff like that. And then they told me to lose weight and like mm-hmm. all, all of a sudden everything that was like, I got cast because I was different. And then I felt like I spent so many years trying to make myself the same. And Ooh, oh my God, so well said. Holy shit. Yeah. And I felt like it really took a toll on my insides. And I didn't know many people out here. I, my, I, you know, I grew up in this tiny town and then I got onto this sitcom by the time I was like 22. And, and it was frightening because all my dreams had come true. Like, you know, like I was on a sitcom, I was making some money. Mm-hmm. Like I thought it was everything that I thought was like, now I'm going to feel okay now. And it was a fun part. I got it as like sort of the funny girl. Like I wasn't. And I, one day I started crying and I couldn't stop. And it was terrifying to me. It was like, but you got everything you wanted. What's mm. wrong with you? And. That was sort of like, I will say for anybody out there that's struggling, I I will say like one of the gifts of being in so much pain, I was willing to start start doing the work and looking at, you know, because it's also the beginning of adulthood. Right. I grew up in this house. Now I'm out in the world. It's not quite like college or high school. You know, you're like, where, and, and sort of a free, like, where do I belong? Who do I belong with? Who am I? Who do I want to like, what? And now what was my hobby is now my job. So like, what's my hobby? All of it. It's just, it was, and I was, in, I was so depressed and I, I really felt like I was going crazy. 
And it took a lot of... It took like a bunch of things that I did that finally kind of put Humpty back together again. And I feared that if I got well, that I wouldn't be funny anymore. And I'm oh, here... We have to talk about that. Oh yes. My God. So I feared that... I Because I felt like so much... And I talked... Look, my... I think my book is a fun read and it's a lot about like, I had a very particular family. It was quirky and funny and wonderful and horrible. And um, the good parts were fantastic and the tough parts were really hard. And, but I felt like a lot of my humor, I think is natural, but then I think a lot of it was disguising some shame or feeling like something was wrong with me or don't look at the man behind the curtain, like just tap dancing to distract from the Oz behind the curtain, pulling the levers of maybe what's unlovable about me. Oh my God. And and I will say, as I sort of did the work and started to, and I talk about this in the book, it's really everything I wish I knew is like when I was 18, you know, that everything, one of the gifts of comedy of what I've learned. And then like I accidentally started doing stand up and and I did it to make money, but like the gift that I thought I had one set, but I would record myself and listen back. And it's the stuff that was sort of all the things that were I thought secretly the worst about me was actually what was the most relatable. That nobody wants to hang out with a perfect person. It's everything that I was trying to hide from you is actually what people liked. And it was just trying to take a little bit of time, but figuring out how to integrate. Like once I started being nicer to that person inside of me and tr- stopped trying to hide her, it was like, oh, that's actually the person that's been getting the jobs the whole time. Like, like maybe, maybe I should be a little bit nicer. Like maybe there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe everything that was wrong with me was told to me by somebody that didn't like themselves very much, you know? Wow. Uh, so was then, so was stand up sort of the transformative piece? in finding the dial on what, who you felt you were authentically at the time versus like, oh, the, sh- the defense mechanism of comedy or what was that piece that changed for you? It's an interesting question. You know, I would say as far as like professionally, so just as far as like my professional life, because it was like personal stuff I did and professional stuff. I would say professionally, stand-up was a big gift because I... Because I was afraid of it. It's how I got my agent. But again, when I started doing stand up, there was very few young ladies doing it. And it's already still kind of a boys club, but it's gotten a lot better, you know? But I, I, I'd never heard the, I had never heard the phrase women weren't funny. I'd never heard it growing up. And until I started doing comedy and then like, then people start saying it to your face. And I didn't quite know how to like thread the needle of that. And I felt like, as I, you know, doing when it was when I was on Chelsea lately and like, and even being on Mad TV, I got, I auditioned with like quirky weirdo characters, but then they wanted, they like dyed my hair blonde and they wanted like the blonde girl in like a party dress. And which really made me resentful, yeah. and, which was irritating. Yeah. But then I was like, well, like that's the only thing they would really let me do at the time. And I was like, all right, well, fuck it. Am I allowed to swear? Is that Okay. Yeah, please. Fuck it. Like, if that's... Okay, I don't see myself like that, but can I still be funny if I'm like not making myself look like a quirky, you know, odd duck, you know? And so it certainly... I wanted to play the odder characters, but it was interesting for me to learn to see like, I'm not going to let them crush my spirit. Like, because I had been on sitcoms where... The sitcoms were the places that like had wanted me to be a certain weight and stuff like that. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to figure out if I can be funny in a party dress. And then, and then doing Chelsea lately, people sort of started to get to know me as me. Like they, like when you're a panelist, like they get to know you as your own personality. And then Bobby Lee, who was on Mad TV and also on Chelsea lately with me, he sort of did an intervention and he was like, Arden, you know, you're the only one on here. You know, we it's it was E and it was late night. So you made a couple hundred bucks doing the appearance. And he was like, you realize you're the only person who's not like cashing in on this. Like everybody else is touring, doing stand up. You, you know, I was an improviser, but like you didn't make much money doing that. He was like, he, he's like, there's no reason for you to not do stand up. Because I'd started doing That's how I got my agent was doing stand up. I was just afraid of it. So at first I did it just because of... Well, I was like, okay, I'm willing to earn, but 
But then the gift of it was... The gift of it was it forced me to be number one on the call sheet. It forced me to not hide behind somebody else. And Mm. probably similar to your one woman show, it's like, who am I up here without somebody else? Like, can I ride out silences where I thought there would be laughs and like my own worst thoughts about myself? And maybe, again, maybe I'm not so bad. Like maybe people want to hear stuff that's not a perfect person up there. Like. And that I feel like it's made me, you know, earlier in my career, I'd done some like theater in New York and I always felt ashamed that I didn't go to Yale or I didn't go to Juilliard or whatever. And then coming back and I've done theater since touring as a stand up. And I'm like, well, that, you know, I have held people's attention for an hour. Like if I can do that, I can do your play. Like, you know, like that's harder because at least theater goers aren't hammered and like, you know, like, I don't know. So it was an interesting thing that helped me get out of my own shame about like every everybody else, but not, I don't know, like just like Oliver Twist, like, please, sir, I'm gonna have some more. There was something of like, it forced me to kind of own myself and own my flaws in a way that was positive. And like taking ownership. I love the when you mentioned in your book about make, building your own boat and how kind of making your own projects, your creative projects was really what helped you hone in on your voice and find yourself. I think that's so true. I think that's really the only way to do it. If you're just spewing somebody else's lines on a sitcom where you're just like spilling, knocking over the plates or like yeah. whatever the gag yeah. is. It's just like not going to help you find your voice or figure out your point of view or anything like that. So I, I loved that that whole idea. With the, with the fear of not being funny if you worked on yourself, that's like, that's so interesting. My, I want to delve into that because my experience was so similar in that Basically, I was a complete people pleaser, complete pushover, like anxious, just wanted to land my mark and say my line, teacher's pet, like just fucking annoying until I was 18. And that's when my mom got diagnosed with cancer for the second time. And it was like, okay, she's going to die any any day now. Then I started just like overcompensating and trying to be funny all the time to 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 mask the pain. Can I ask you a question? To pull the curtain over the eyes. Did you yes, did yes. people know what was going on? Because my dad, I had to say goodbye to my dad in the hospital starting when I was in sixth grade, and and I wasn't really supposed to tell anybody what was happening. But even still, even if people knew, there's something weird about being like a young person, a kid. And everybody else is just at school worrying about like going to the school dance or whatever. And like, meanwhile, your mom's dying of cancer, you know, like it's a weird, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to know where to put those feelings, you know? No, absolutely. My mom had, had many health scares throughout my childhood. So it was always kind of, if, if it wasn't one surgery, it was another. And the whole family waited with bated breath when mom had her breast exam every three months. And it was just, we, it, it was constantly, looming and scary in a way that I just don't know what childhood would would have been like without that. Yeah. It was just such such a cloud over all of it, you know? Yeah. Um, but then when she when the cancer recurred, I was like the last to know. Right. My mom always shielded things from me. So and but we but she was not smart enough to realize that we shared an email account because there were no boundaries. Right. So I could right. just see the emails that she's sending to my brothers and the production coordinators about like, hey my cancer's back. And I'm like, it do you have cancer again? Right. Like it's that what's happening. And then I swung into the opposite where I overcompensated, thought I had to be funny all the time because I didn't want people to know the the amount of pain that I was in. And I, and I am sensitive to people being there in trying times because I, I tend to fear the manipulation of like, Oh, they just want to be the savior and they don't want me to be strong enough to do it on my own. So then I've got that whole fucking weird narrative going on. I'm overcompensating, trying to be funny. I'm like doing winks and guns to like the cameraman when I walk in. I don't know who that person was, but it was really, it was just reaching. It was painful. I'm assuming anybody who was watching me saw the desperation that was underneath (laughs) my sense of humor at the time. And it really, it just, it made me not funny. Like I was trying to be funny, but I wasn't being genuine, which was where I think humor comes from. It's where, you know, these tragedies that you're talking about in your book, it's like, that's where I think you, the, the funny is. Yeah. It's like that humanity, that universality comes through. And I think I only started to really check in with like a legitimate sense of humor that I can in some way agree with now 
once I realized that version of myself was just overcompensating. Is, does any of this resonate? Did, oh my God. Did you have that Oh my all? God. I wanted to just, I just want to say like, I just want to give you a hug. And I was sitting here, not only do I relate, I actually, you're the first person I've talked. Okay. I mean, I really, <laughs> so specifically to so my dad, my dad, basically, he was a really bad alcoholic and then he quit drinking, but his, he had such bad damage to his liver that, and then he just, ate cake and was diabetic and yeah, yeah. and like so and and just had just was just not a healthy guy so if it wasn't one thing it was heart attacks and you know diabetes and cirrhosis all of it so I will tell you on like every big job that I've had my very first pilot table read uh, you know 22 years old at NBC I remember my dad had had a heart attack and he was doing some surgery on like his carotid otter- artery. And we had to find out, like basically I had to like call and find out if he was alive or dead at the end of it. You know what I mean? Like I was in a Steve Martin play. Like it was student, it was like the premiere of his play opening night, right before curtain, you know, a couple of years later, your dad's on the way to the hospital. He's probably going to die. And I remember saying to like my brother or something like, well, if he's dead now, he'll be dead in two hours when like, I can't deal with this. Like I can't. Yeah. And like, but then this weird hyper vigilance of, you know, you're still a human being. So you, you have so much extra adrenaline and your heart is breaking because it's a parent who's like in distress and like they're very easily could be dying and then you have to go be funny and be on point and also not burden your coworkers with it it is like it's how could you not be fired like what were you supposed to do you know what i mean like i look back on the, like that little girl that was that young woman and i look back on myself like god bless us we're fucking warriors and like w- like we showed up and we did our jobs and you know I just think you're a miracle. Like rather than being hard on yourself of it was probably either that or like breaking down and sobbing. So like, what are you supposed to, what is the option? And, you know, I mean, I think what was, what was interesting about writing this, writing the book, like, and so many, like there's been so many parts of my life that um, I just hope to give people, I would like to give people hope that, you can survive and like, and like, it doesn't, you don't have to hide the things that happen to you that you can see how they can like, like, like you with your podcast, that they can be of service to other people, but yeah. that it doesn't have to define, like that you can still lead a beautiful, happy, joyful adulthood or wherever you are, even if you can hold both, both things can be true. There can be... I mean, look, I wrote the book when I was like actively grieving <laughs> and there can you can still have like joy in the day and it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Like, like you didn't cause any of that. It's part of the human experience. Like it sounds like a complicated hand was dealt to you. And there's so many plate, there's so many things you can do where you can like create your own not to sound, it sounds like a cult, but like that you can have like your own, <laughs> like, like it's that you don't have to run from what happened to you. I feel like the more I used to run, the worse, the f- worse it got. But even just accepting and being like, wow, I did, I come by a lot of this stuff honestly. It, you know, it served me for a while, overcompensating served me for a while, or like whatever, you know, things I use to like check out or whatever. Like it, I needed it. And, mm. And, and it worked for me and like now it's safe to kind of like, you know, talk to people and ask for help and then, and then start to put the fun stuff in. Like, again, going back to like the gift of grief of like, what does feel good? Who does feel good? Who's interesting to you? Like, what do you, mm-hmm. what do you want to be around? I remember I had no idea how a healthy relationship looked because my parents married on a dare and like, you know, it was just crazy. And so I literally just started like looking around and like I had a lot of older friends. I was always like everyone's interns. I knew a lot of couples that were a bit older than me that were like married or had kids. And I just looked around and asked them like, what do you do on a Sunday? Like, what do you do all? Like I knew how to be fun at a party, but I didn't know like, what do you do like on a Tuesday? Like, I don't get it. And I just asked a lot of questions and I kind of pieced together what looked kind of 
good and happy for me and what didn't seem to work for me. And that you can, even if you weren't dealt like necessarily the full hand that you wanted, like that you you can give it to yourself. You can be perfectly formed. I love that. I've yeah, I definitely felt a, a big dose of you seem like you want to just lift other people up and encourage them. And I felt that throughout your book. And it's just such an like you just yes. seem like you're on everybody's team. It's really lovely. I am because I I know like very few people I know have like a perfect situation, you know? And Oh my God, nobody I, does. That was the thing yeah. that I I I once I once shit started hitting me, it was like, oh, then the people who are reaching out, like, hey, this thing happened to me and you know, I'm here for you. This and it's like, oh, everybody's got it. Everybody has shit that's happened. It's crazy. I know it was so interesting. Like when I look back, you know, growing up, I grew up in this town, this like it's almost like a Nantucket type town, but we live there year round. And so every summer, all these sort of like wealthy attractive people would come in to like spend summers by the sea, you know? And, but it wasn't like, it's not like the Hamptons or I mean, there's no like restaurants or stores. It's just like a very pretty place. And that's where I grew up year round. And I remember like, I always felt different and excluded and weird and not good enough. And like looking back, I now know a lot of them as adults and they're all lovely people. And I, I think I just judged that they had every that they were better than me somehow because maybe they had a little more money or they were better at sports or whatever. And it's just, and then I look and now I know some of what was going on in their families. You know, mm. and it, they all seem perfect. Like I just knew I had this wonderful, wonderful mom and this, you know, kind of n- pretty nasty dad with a drinking problem and. And but that was a secret, like nobody could know. And and I just thought everyone else like had the perfect family. And the reality was a lot of people had like complicated hands dealt to them that I had no clue. I was just too. I felt so bad about myself. I couldn't. They would invite me to do things, yes. and I would never go. Yeah, yeah. I I feel that too. Or I'd be so well, the, this, I'd just be feeling so terrible that it's like I couldn't quite see outside of myself to even be able to connect with anybody else because I was just so mired in my own muck and issues and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I want to touch back on the fear of, of not being funny if you worked on your shit. What, yeah. Was this a thing in your, was it mostly in your 20s? Is it was, when did th- that start to shake up? And And what made you realize, oh, if I work on my shit, I can... For me, my experience was that once I once I started working on my shit, I was like, oh no, now this is where I'm actually locating my sense of humor versus whatever that thing was before. When, when What was that for you? I would say I've had two rounds of it. One of them was around 23 to 27 or 8. Like hardcore, hardcore. Mm. And I and I really feel like that's a really pivotal time for women. I really oh my do. Oh God, yes. I think, I think that there's no more change than from 23 to 27. It's fucking hard. Hands down. Yeah. I felt, and I was like, I had everything I, th- I had, it was like, there was really nothing on paper I didn't have, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, and that was so scary to me. I, it was when I got the sitcom, I, Again, growing up in a town, I we had a general store and no stoplights. The fact that somehow I'd done it, I'd like made my way on it. Like I moved yeah. it into my TV. I did it. Mission accomplished, you know? And <laughs> it was literally, it was my second year there. It was the second season. And I was dating this guy who kind of sucked. And I I just started crying one day and I couldn't stop. And it was... Part of it was like, you know, I'd lived in New York when I booked the show. And... And it was, it was, I don't know if this happened to you. Did you grow up in LA or did you move here for your show? Uh, I lived in Garden Grove, uh, nicknamed Garbage Grove. And <laughs> my mom would just drive me back and forth uh, from LA. She learned to drive the freeway for me, but really for her, because it was her dream and not mine. <laughs> wow. So, okay, go on, so, go on. <laughs> I, so I remember like when I got, I don't know if this, if you had this experience, but like when I got the sitcom, I think for some people, it was almost too much too fast. Like I felt almost punished for it like a little bit of oh it was Ah. almost like it was almost like it was like it's like that I'd abandon people like I'd abandon like you're moving to LA you're abandoning as as if planes didn't fly east you know and like all of a sudden I was making more money than my dad like who was my accountant who I had to fire you know like um and 
And there is, I remember my dad had a heart attack and my mom got cancer. Again, I found out it was like fifth, the fifth thing she told me on her list also. I was like... That made me laugh in the book. Yeah. True story. All true. But I, I remember there was, it was almost like, what do you care? You got money. Like at the time, like, and I remember I would buy things for people because I felt like, I felt like I could either have success and happiness and my dreams come true or I could have love that somehow if I had success that it was hurting people but that I couldn't have both and I just started crying and you know so I started going to therapy and and then you know I started doing other groups of things and which really helped me and I was concerned like I was worried I I couldn't go on as is because I couldn't stop crying mm. So it wasn't really an option. I almost feel like I was a trapeze artist and somebody had come along and set my trapeze on fire, but I didn't want them to. Like I was I was fine, but it was killing me, you know? Yes, and then there's yes. that period of time where you're in the air and you don't know what your new life looks like. You're trusting that another trapeze is coming, but you've already... And the other one you can't go back to because it's been set on fire and it's now in flames and it's ashes and like there's nothing to go back to. So like... There's that weird period where it's a leap of faith when you start to do things differently and you start trying things out or going to therapy or going to wherever, whatever your thing is, like going yeah. to going to yoga or going to a 12-step thing or going to some kind of a group therapy situation. I don't know, whatever your thing, you start working on yourself and then but but you're not fully cooked yet. So you're not like you're trusting that the other trapeze is coming, but you don't know what it looks like. And that was like I was we, I remember going on pilot auditions, really very out of body, sort of as you were saying, like the equivalent of the gun's finger firing of like, I know <laughs> I I was trained enough to know how to like ring the bell and spin the plate and bonk the horn. But like, <laughs> but my heart was not in it because I was not okay. And I was worried that if I took a look under the hood of my car of my soul... I was worried that there was so much darkness from, I think quite honestly from growing up with my dad, that if I looked, if I really looked at it, that it would take me under, that everything he'd said about me was like maybe true or that it would just suck that, that like I seemed fun at a party, but if you got to know me, like he was just so nasty to me. I was concerned that if I really stopped and looked, I would never be able to come out. But the it actually had the opposite effect for me was was actually looking at it and going, I think of it like as I started to do the work and that I, I think of it like, like a UPS guy had come every day my entire life for like 24 years going, hey, this is a package for your dad. He's not home. Can I store it in your studio apartment? <laughs> you know, and then eventually yeah. there's like no room for your shit. You're just stuck with somebody else's packages. And I felt like in my mid 20s, I started being like, this isn't mine. Like, Take this back. Oh my like, God. Get yes. out of here. Just get this shit out of here. Yes. And and like, I don't know why, you know, I my mom was so great. And, you know, but she was very much of like, oh, I don't know. But like when he did finally, when he passed away, the, it actually felt so validating. She did say to me, she was like, I don't know why he always was so hard on you. Like he just never liked me. And I don't, it was nothing I did. It was literally from the moment I flew into Earth. It just... And there was something that was like, okay, I'm not crazy. And all of this stuff, mm. this was not mine. This was a guy that did not like himself very much. Who also had... A, he had a tough mom. You know, it's like, this was just not a happy person. And, you know, he did get sober, but he didn't go to AA. He didn't go do the steps. He just was like, he just transferred it to eating cake. And... <laughs> So it was the same sort of, he had the same spirit, but everybody was so happy that he was sober that people let him get away with like his vibe. Whatever. So it was just tiptoeing around it because he was well. So you, you know, because he was sober. So it was just like the beauty. I feel like what was hard for me and a lot of the women is starting to sort out like, maybe I don't need to believe this stuff anymore. And maybe all the stuff that was put on me actually has nothing to do with me. And maybe... I need to get to know like, who am I without like the good and the bad stuff. But maybe like I can take, sort of take stock of things and maybe a lot of this awful stuff that was said to me, like truly, it was just because I was on earth and living in that house, not because of the essence of who I am. And it really was so freeing. Like it was really worth it. 
And what I found was, you know, if you fly into the world, like, sounds like you're a funny person. And like, I think, I think I was a silly, genetically sort of, I came out a little funny. And like, and that when I removed, when I removed the part of me that believed him, that thought he was right and something was wrong with me. And it was really just like, no, I'm okay as is, including as a person who grew up with that. I feel like I got parts that had more humanity and depth to them and that it could be all of it. Interesting. It's like the path kind of started aligning with you as you were growing. I do. I feel like it's like my inside started to integrate with my outsides. That as oh I, my God. As I shed myself up, and as I started, and I'll tell you the truth. So then the second part, you know, in my standup, I've never been that personal. I never really told that many, I would tell embarrassing stories about myself, but I was never that personal. And Why? What was it? Why, why were you not? I think, honestly, there was something about, I've always been somewhat private just in that. I don't know if it was that New England side of me that was brought up kind of be able to keep secrets or... I felt like, you know, I am, I actually like, I always dated terrible guys. And then like, I actually ended up like meeting a nice guy and not ruining it and not running away and like marrying a nice guy, which is who's like, and I, and I remember thinking I didn't want to jinx it. And I also thought there's nothing funny in that. Like, hey guys, are you happily married? <laughs> like, it's not that funny. And I also felt like if I really started talking about some about my family on stage, I, I appreciate well, one of the things I love about my, like the fans from Chelsea Lately and stuff like that is I think they're somewhat protective of me. And so I would start mm. to try to t- say stuff. But I think to me, I almost feel like the book format is like the perfect version of that to know that it turned out okay. Like just guys, if you're listening and you buy the book, it everything turns out okay. Because on stage as I'm telling it, what I think is funny and then people go, oh, like I have a weird thing where people get protective, which then hurts comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But like, but I will say the interesting thing, and I feel like I'm rambling and please cut no, me no, off no. if I am, but like doing the podcast was the interesting, we joke like, So it was all about The Bachelor and I love it and it's so fun and I feel, you know, I get some social anxiety and like I have found one of the things I like about doing the podcast is like I can get to know people in a way that feels safe and relaxing and I've made a lot of friends doing it and I, you know, and then both of my parents happened to die like two nights before a Bachelor episode. So like (laughs) I had to debate whether to keep doing the do the podcast or not. And and again, your body knows. And I cancel it a lot of things. I I quickly eliminated a lot of things from my schedule, but I wanted to do the podcast. And so I was able both times to the first time with my dad just to be like, hey, I'm, you know, in my family living room. I did it with my brother and my mom. We did it. And like it was actually sort of nice to have a distraction. And then the second time my mom was sort of a regular on the podcast. Mm. So it was so but like it happened again. And then my brother and I did the podcast. No, that's not true. I'm sorry. It was Wells Adams and Rob Bennett. I called in and we still did the podcast. But it's been an interesting thing. Again, I was worried that it would frighten the podcast listeners. I was worried that they had been coming to talk about, you know, hairless, hairless dental assistants falling, looking for love. And instead, they're going to have like this, you know, like, oh my God, my parents died. And what actually happened was, yeah the listeners like loved that and they were, they all ro- rose to the challenge. And then, so I started talking about, I don't know, I, I just decided, I, I constructed this thing called grief Island. That was sort of my like healing place. Yeah. And yeah. there, but there was something about like, I would just talk about what I was doing on grief Island to take care of myself for like the month or two afterwards, which was like watching queer eye or the great British bake off or like going for walks. And I would, So people then would email in even more often that they actually appreciated hearing because they were having stuff or that they... So they say it's the only podcast about The Bachelor and grief. (laughs) But like... But like... But that again, that is like the even deeper level of integrating. If I get well, people won't think I'm funny. And that's for me, it's like if I really tell you what's going on, 
I thought it would scare people off. And in fact, it did the opposite. And it's interesting with this book coming out with my mom, like the fact that I really feel like whatever you want to call it, the universe, my mom was barely in it. And like, there's no ignoring the fact that I sold it on the way to her funeral. And so my heart, like, I just feel like almost, what is it? The Velveteen Rabbit. Like, I feel like I just keep getting more and more real. And it feels like, like each different layer of knowing that it's safe for me to get more and more real. And I think it makes you a better performer and artist. And it doesn't mean it's not still funny, but that it's actually more relatable. And I think in this, in the world now, I think more and more people want that. You know, everyone's, people are struggling. And so I think they, they can tell if you're being fake. And oh my God, 100%. I think people want to genuinely connect. It makes sense that people would latch on to the personal things that you're sharing in the, in the, in your podcast. I feel like there's also this thing, a fear that I had of, 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 oh, well, I won't be funny because I'll sound too like therapized. I'll right. sound like I'm just, I've just walked out of a therapy session and, oh, well, the reason why I, you know, whatever, I'm going to be talking like this different voice. I didn't realize that you could talk about things from a healthy perspective and not sound lame. Like, I you, thought that you just are going to sound lame, you know? Honestly, I always felt it was a fine line. Because I look back, I did do a one-woman show when I was 27. and no I No kidding. Oh my God. I did. And I think it was too early for me. I felt... I actually am really proud of it. But I remember feeling too exposed. Like, it was too honest. It felt too... I was proud of it, but I personally wasn't ready for it. And Mm. I remember as I was writing the book, I'd read a few books and I always felt like I, as I was writing it, like threading the needle, there was a few books I'd read of different memoirs, of different, like not just performers, all kinds of people. And I was like... I wanted to err not on... I wanted to make sure it wasn't like, get thee to a therapist. Like, I wanted to make sure... Like, is this something... I... I, Because I, I had read a few things. I was like, ooh, you should just tell your therapist that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it sure, was like sure. a fine line of like threading the needle. And it was interesting, like particularly with both parents gone. It's like, okay, I don't want to like smear the dead. But I also <laughs> want to tell the truth. And... I, yeah. I had a friend who's like a my friend Tom, he's a wonderful playwright. He's been nominated for a Pulitzer and I would like call him like a couple times a week as I was doing it. And he was like he would just say like Arden just check your motives. Like is it necessary? Like why are you doing it? Are you doing it like is there still pain attached in a way that's you know like just sort of checking the wound to see like, is this something that should just be private between you and your therapist? Sure, sure. Or is this like a fun part of your story or a necessary part of your story or an honest part of your story? And so that was definitely like, I I kept trying to... I, I had a friend that read it. You know, I was like, is there anything that feels too icky? Like too over, too TMI. Like, is there any TMI of like, you know, so I had a friend do a TMI read to make sure sure it wasn't too, too. Yeah. That's interesting. That was, that, that, that was on your mind. I feel like, and I guess I sort of expressed this earlier, but like the, the thing that makes things funny is if they come from the pain. Like, I almost feel like the pain is integral to, to making something click or or sink in yes. or for at least me as an as a viewer or a listener or whatever to really for it to resonate for me to connect it's like i've got to know that that genuine spirit i've got to know that pain yes. so then i can laugh with you if i know where you hurt i'm going to be able to laugh right with you whereas if if it's just some person who's all ego and going up there and no pain and no you know i'm just like okay what are we why are we doing this but you're absolutely <laughs> you know? right you're absolutely right. like you, we i always like even just in like comedic acting, you know, like the roles are the most interesting is like, where is the pain? What is the flaw? I love a flawed character that doesn't think they're flawed. I love like yes. somebody who's... Oh my God. Yeah. That's pe- the best. Pedal to the metal of like a skewed point of view and just owning it. And like, <laughs> because I really do believe like everyone's doing the best that they can. And, and look, life is no joke, man. I mean, this is a freaking journey here. And I think just the more... Like, as long as you have a couple of people that you can be honest about, like, what's going on with... Like, it has helped me... 
I thankfully have gotten, I feel like more and more, I've sort of weeded out the people that if I have to fake it around them, it's hard for me to be around them anymore. Again, just trying to integrate my insides with my outsides so that, so that, because I do believe like when I try and deny it or fight it or cheer it up, like if I could just accept, like particularly when I was like actively grieving, if I was with somebody that they were not terrified and that, that it was okay that I was in pain, then I could actually go have a laugh and have a good time because I didn't have to make them comfortable. Like, no, no, she was, you know, it happened fast. Like if I didn't have to cheer them up, if I could just be like, I feel fucking crazy. I miss my mom. Where the fuck's my mom? Let's go do karaoke. Like (laughs) that was like, you know what I mean? It was the people that were so edgy that then I would have... I do... the, the she's in a better place, people. I just can't. Like the ones <laughs> that to me that are like, no, your mom's in a better place. Your mom is in St. Louis. I'll trade you with my my mom's like fucking planted in my lemon tree, right? Like I'll trade you. You know, like my oh, mom's in a fucking you. better place. Like my mom's dead. Your mom's in a better place. Like just sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yes, yeah. like, yeah, yes. I can't with that. So again, like it says. It was just only having a roster of people in my life that if I could, if I could admit that I was fucking batshit, then if I could relax about that, then I actually would have fun. Yes, absolutely. I used, I had an ex where I would start crying. I'd be like, I miss my mom. And he'd be like, oh, I can't believe that happened to you. And then he'd start crying. And I'd be like, how, how did this end up with me comforting you, dude? Dude, my mom's going to die. Can like, I stop. Just, can I just tell you something that was like so mind boggling? My what? friend... Her ex-husband cried all the time. And I didn't realize she was like, yeah, that's a bully move. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, bullies manipulate it. So they cry and like, you have to deal with them. And it's like, what? Oh my God, you're right. Like, how about the fact that like sweet Jeanette's mom died and she gets kids, she just have that fucking moment. Trust me, I had a few friends that I had to, that like the, you know, the day of the burial, like there was like four people there and somebody texted me and was like, I'm just having a really hard time. I feel really disconnected from you. It's like, yeah, because I just fucking buried my, yeah, I'm disconnected. Like, I'm just trying to tie my shoelaces, girl. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. don't make me um, deal. Don't make me deal with your feelings about me today. Like I yeah. can't with that. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, it, it the the funeral day is is a real is always one for the books. I feel like, dude, just I mean, just I couldn't handle all the kindness that came my way. It touched me so much when people would when people would look at you with like such compassion, and it was like so it'd be weird who got you, like the plumber or something, and you're like, don't look <laughs> at me like that plumber. Like I can't. I'm just trying to keep my fucking mascara on, plumber. Like I can't handle this. Not today, devil. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I feel you. I want to be mindful of your time here. If you don't mind, I have like one or two quick wrap up questions that I would love to get to. But if you got to run, I'm not going any. I'm here for you, my bunny. I am all, oh, okay. I am a fan of yours. I am at your service. <laughs> Ask me anything. The last thing I wanted to circle back to was your mom kind of validating your experience with your dad, it sounds like, yeah. on, like after he passed. Yeah. And what what that was like was was you know sometimes when somebody validates something, their the pain can kind of like surface with it. It can also just legitimize the experience in a way where you were always like, "Was that me? Was that me?" And then somebody saying something makes you go like, "Oh fuck, no! This was this was it." Like, how did that impact things? And and what what was her role um, before then? What had she? Was this really the first time she had acknowledged how your dad was to you? Oh my God. It was, it was, thank you for asking. It was truly, I feel like, I feel like part of my twenties were so painful because, because nobody in my family had ever really talked about like my dad's drinking or the effects. It was just sort of like, he went to rehab. We went to family week. We never talked about it again. We got like the serenity coin, threw it out the window. He started eating cake. Good thing that's over. Well. You know what I mean? <laughs> the right, end. Right. But glad that doesn't affect me anymore. And yeah. and then like, as I moved out to LA and had some distance, and my mom and I were really close and she was a blast and a great mom. Her Achilles heel was this guy. Like 
she just, you know, I, I, she, you just keep it nice, keep it, everything's fine. It's just like, as long as everything's, you know, like, it, and and it, it, she came by it honestly. She wore little white gloves to, I mean, it was a different era and yeah. for her that she grew up in. And I remember when I moved out to LA and I started like, when I really, I felt that the world forced me the world woke me up was when I started crying. I was like, and that, which was the biggest gift because I started to like be like, wait a minute, maybe everything that I thought about myself isn't accurate. I remember I started to try to go like wake up the whole family. Like we had to talk about this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Which I think everybody who's ever like, oh, come I've from, been there. Everybody yeah. has done that. It's like, you know what? You know what? Whoever, mom, dad, brother, sister, grandma, like we need to talk about, it. here's a letter I'm going to write you. You know what's not okay? I mean, I like the, looking back now, it's like, I just want to give that young lady a hug. And it's like, girl, you can only save yourself. And like, yep. If yeah, there's, yeah, if you change yeah. one variable in an equation, you get a different outcome. And and I made myself so crazy trying to wake everybody up and be like, "Dad did this," blah blah blah. And like, and then for the most crazy I felt when it was when my mom would be like, "I don't know, that's not true." Like, there's a pink elephant in the living room. I'm pointing at the elephant, and somebody, everybody else, saying like, "I don't see that." You know, right? <laughs> you feel. Right fucking crazy, which is when I didn't talk to them for years. Like, I can't keep up this narrative, you know? So like, mm-hmm. so then I started doing things and doing work that really helped me. And there's so many great places out there that you can go for help. And and I, again, I let her off the hook. Eventually I realized, okay, it's, my jo- it's none of my business why she was loyal to him. It's none of my business why, like, she loved him. Like, if, and the reason I had a relationship with him is because she was married to him. It's like, okay, I'm going to respect her husband. Like, even though he's not a good dad, I love my mom so much. If I want a relationship, they stayed married. So like, if I want to see my mom, I'm going to be respectful to my dad. And, but it was never, but it was, that's why I had a relationship with him. Not because he was ever changed. And, right. And I will say like, when she finally said that, when he died, and I don't think I was, I don't know why she said it. I don't remember I felt, I felt like this riddle I'd been trying to answer my entire life, even though, even with all the work I'd done, and I knew it was like a unanswerable riddle. I still kept thinking, maybe there's one angle I didn't try. Yep, yep, yep. And when she said it, I felt relaxed and not crazy. And I felt sad that he just didn't. He didn't like me and he was hard on me for no reason. From the moment I arrived, he just, my, he'd already made up his mind. I mean, the first words he said about me were, she's not a blonde, she's a redhead. I never met a redheaded woman I trusted. Like those were his first words. And Mm -hmm. like, who says that about a baby? Like, you know, like, but like, it was just, when I realized, I always felt that I had somehow something about me brought it on. And it was like, no, this happened with like in the cellular level. This has nothing. I didn't do anything except for arrive. Like I, I didn't do it. I didn't instigate this. It was written in the stars. Like it was so freeing to also say maybe there's not only maybe is have I always been lovable. Maybe I always was, and maybe there was never anything wrong with me. It was huge. Huge. It's transformative, huh? Yeah. It was huge. And again, I think if I hadn't, you know, done 15 years of work before that, <laughs> like it could have been just that moment. But like, I really feel like if you, if you put in the work, but then also go have a little fun, like, you know, that you don't have to be fully cooked to be lovable. You don't have to be meaning. You don't have to be at the end of your done with therapy or done with EMDR or on the 12th step or like whatever. Like if you're just at least like doing a little bit a day going towards the light, you don't need to spend all day every day. Like, you know, it's just like a little at a time, inch by inch. And then like, and then lean into what, like I'm a big believer in what makes your tail wag. Listen to that little, you know, I feel like along the way I've learned, I've learned 
when I really calm down that I actually have good instincts and I probably always have had mm. good instincts and it's just up to me to allow myself to listen to them. And like, what makes your tail wag? What's fun for you? What's fun for me is talking about The Bachelor with silly people. Like, what's fun for me is coming and talking to Jeanette. Like, I've said no to other things, but I was excited to come talk to Jeanette. Like, what makes... And to allow like, okay, I thought that would make my tail wag and instead I... My tail is tucked between my legs. I don't like that. You know, it's like, okay. Sure. That's part of like, it's just a little spaghetti at the wall. It's a little bit of an experiment. Not everything's going to be a home run. It's okay. Like trying to have a little bit of fun. Like you can have a little fun along the way that it, I think for a few years, it was just me trying to fix oh. myself. Like, yeah, well, fuck yeah, it. Yeah. I'm never going to be fully cooked. So like, I may as well start having a better time <laughs> and, you know, keep doing the stuff and like, Stick with people that feel good and just listen to your inner compass, you know? Like, what's the next indicated action? What What's the next simple thing that feels right and fun and, you know, being of service that you can do something in the world that makes a difference? I mean, I think your podcast is really of a lot of service to people. I think, it, you know, your story, I don't know. That would be my, that would be my two cents. No, I love that. And thank you. And I feel like that's very timely. I actually wrote in my morning pages today that I've been like thinking a lot about the word fun. Yes. <laughs> As I say it, I'm like, oh, that's probably not what an actually fun person writes. But no, <laughs> I have to, to decide to start having fun. <laughs> By the way, I do morning pages every day. Well, okay. Thank you so much. I will let you go. You've been so generous with your time. And I enjoyed this conversation so fucking much. Oh I, I really had a blast talking to you. Oh my God. Sweet Jeanette. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> and I can't wait till the world is normal. I hope I would love to meet you in real life sometime. That would be great. Yes. Let's make that happen for sure. As soon as this pandemic is uh, done. I'm, good. I'm good rooting for years. you. I have a Same special you. thing for your listeners. Oh. With the, with the book, with the, that cute tote that you got. Yes. For 250 people, if you go to ArdenMarineBook.com, and my last name is a weird one. It's got a Y in it. It's M-Y-R-I-N. ArdenMarineBook.com. For the first 250 people, you get the book. You get the cute lunch tote bag. And you get it. It's, it the book is signed all for the price of the book. So ArdenMarineBook.com. You get the tote and you get a signed book. Oh, that's such a great deal. Oh my God. Thank you for, for sharing. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Bye.